let's please welcome the director, the producer, the writer, the composer of Once Upon a Time in Mexico and the Mexico Trilogy, Robert Rodriguez. Welcome. Hi. Hello. Hey, Senor Cristobal. Hi. Thank you all. You weren't required to watch the whole theme. Who, who saw all three movies, by the way? We quite a few. Holy shit. Wow. A real marathon today. <laughs> what a marathon. <laughs> That's amazing. So let's go back to the very beginning. The production yeah. story of El Mariachi is very famous. Um, with you, you made it famous in Rebel Without a Crew, your amazing book um, that details this for, for first time filmmakers. But tell us a little about the story and the character of El Mariachi. He's kind of a, he's a tragic figure, and a lot of people have compared him to characters in samurai movies. And wow, that's amazing. <laughs> let's see, how did that character start? Uh, you know, Carlos Gallardo, the guy who played the Mariachi, I met him in high school. And I was making these. <laughs> I was making kung fu movies. Basically, I had a, a VCR that that um, had a cable, like a twelve foot cable, and a camera attached, video camera. My dad had. So I was making movies since I was twelve or thirteen on video, and you could only see what you were focusing and and the iris control by looking at a TV monitor. So as far as I could pull it out into the backyard, it was only about ten feet. So I would just aim the camera and I would just do kung fu movies over and over, until my siblings start, saw like the twentieth one and said, "Is this all you're gonna do? Is make?" You and your friend kicking each other's ass the whole yeah. thing. Say, but it's good. And they say, okay, I'll come up with a story for the next one. Maybe put some dialogue. And so I would go to Mexico, where he was from, and we would shoot these little small micro versions of this, like 10, 15 minute movies. And they're all the same. He would come into town, meet some bad guys, get beat up, get them back, and then leave. And there was always a dog in it, because that was his dog. <laughs> and uh, we just made those every summer for fun. And I would practice and yeah. practice filmmaking. And just, just kind of for fun. And then when we went to make this one for the home market, Spanish home video market, that's why it's in Spanish. And that's one part of the mariachi legend of all the crazy stories you hear about the medical research and <laughs> shooting one take and $7,000. The part I purposely left out, I was most embarrassed about, was the fact that I didn't speak Spanish at all. <laughs> so not only did I shoot it you know, with no crew and no money on film that I barely knew how to operate it, but I shot it in a language I didn't even speak. So I'd tell the actors, vamos a recordar, thinking that meant let's record, and they'd look at me like, what the fuck's he saying? I mean, that means let's remember. What? Remember what? I just did my lines. But, I, <laughs> but anyway, I, I decided to make like a real story this time. I thought, let's, let me actually write a script this time, and you'll come into town, and I, and I want to do a character that we can do several of these movies for, for the Spanish home video market. Because my big idea was, I saw that you could sell uh, some, some producer that made these straight to cheap, cheapo movies to the video market. He said, hey, he saw some of my stuff. You should make one for us. We make them for thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. I said, 30 or 40, these things are garbage. They're shot on home video. There's no action in them. I bet we could make a really kick-ass one for 5000 shot on film. And we could blow those guys away. So, but we didn't know. So I said, let's test it. But if I could make three films in Spanish for the home market as practice, where I would learn writing, directing, shooting, lighting, it would be like a school you got paid to, to go to. So I thought it was a great idea. I, and I didn't plan for the first one to even be seen, which is why I just shot one take of everything. But I wanted to come up with a character, kind of like a road warrior type character. That's probably where it came from, because that's a very hero, hero myth that George Miller crafted around Mad Max, this guy who kind of wanders in from the desert. But I wanted mine to be kind of like a Hitchcock missing identity person because I knew I couldn't afford to make the first idea I had, which was more like Desperado, a guy with a guitar case full of guns. So that's gonna require a lot of action. And I don't, the, my first movie probably should be simpler. So then I thought, let me come up with the genesis of that character. Maybe he was a musician first, and maybe he didn't have the guitar case full of guns. Maybe there's another guy dressed in black. Because I always loved how mariachis looked. Yeah. They had the little short jacket and they had the buckles down the side. They always looked like yeah. badass action guys to me. <laughs> and I thought, people don't know much about mariachis unless you're Mexican. So when people, if you give them like a mariachi uh, a gun in the guitar case, people will think mariachis, you should be afraid of them. You know? So I thought that could be a cool myth, change the myth of the mariachi. And I love the idea of the guitar. Yeah. And, as a, as a, and, the, and the artist as a hero, I thought would be kind of fine. Because I was an artist, I, I was a cartoonist, and I thought, I want to see an artist be the hero. So that's kind of cool starting him as a guitar player, and then he loses everything, and he loses his ability to play. 
and it ends setting up a sequel that maybe we'll get to go make. But I, my whole plan was to make three of them for the Spanish home video market. Whatever I could sell them for, I would keep to put towards my first real first film, English language, American film, to send to festivals. Because I was young, I was like 22 when I started making El Mariachi, and my short films were winning festivals, and I thought, I need to practice telling feature stories, but in a way where I can fail when nobody sees me. So I'll just hide it on Mexican Spanish video. <laughs> And, uh, and nobody will know, and my friends love foreign films, I'll be able to say, hey, I made a foreign film, it's over there in the Mexican Spanish home video section at H-E-B. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and I, I purposely didn't want anyone to even really see it, so I kind of did it as a joke, because I was a cartoonist, I thought, I don't really want anyone to see it. So I'm gonna call it El Mariachi, which promises no action. That's, on, that's like calling an action movie, instead of Lethal Weapon, calling it The Guitar Player. Who's gonna go watch an action movie called The Guitar Player? My whole joke was, Maybe if somebody rents it because they're desperate for entertainment, they'll be shocked that it's got more action than the other yeah. movies that they were getting. It has and a cryptic feeling, though, that, like just the single word, El Mariachi. But that's all accident. So that wasn't the, that was not yeah. the vision. Later, of course, in retrospect, it seems brilliant, but it was not. It was really just, what a dumb idea. What, no one's ever going to rent this, but I didn't want people to see it. That's why I just shot one take of everything. The reason I shot one take of the whole film was because when you're shooting on film, and I was shooting in Mexico, you don't develop it and see if it came out. I wouldn't get to see the footage until the whole movie was shot. So I didn't even know if that camera I borrowed even worked. So I said, let's just shoot one take of everything. When I go home, I'll develop it. Because if I shoot two takes, I just doubled my budget, because all the money was going towards film, developing and, and, sh and um, buying it. Let me go shoot the whole thing. I'll go see what didn't come out. And whatever didn't come out, I'll go back and just reshoot that piece not shoot a safety take of everything or I'll be broke. I, I gotta see if I can even sell this thing. And when Columbia got a hold of it, you know, when they, we weren't, they weren't gonna release it, they wanted to remake it. Um, but then they tested it to an audience. They said, we wanna test it in front of an audience because we don't know if, before we remake it, we don't know if people will like the idea that, that she dies at the end. So I said, okay, so we screen it to an audience and the audience liked it the way it was. <laughs> they wanted to take it to the festivals. And I said, no, don't show this movie. This was my practice film. <laughs> Give me $2,000, I'll reshoot half of it. If I had known people were going to see it, I would have done things completely different. And they were smart enough to say, no, you got something really special here. We should leave it the way it is. It's such a unique story. Um, but, but you've always been on the forefront, too, of technology. And the third film you shot on HD. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was and pretty early. I mean, in 2003, not many yeah, people had made that transition. And what was that? I mean, it, carrying over these films through you know, over, over 10 years, yeah. how, what was it like adopting video for well, this? What was cool is it felt like I was going back to El Mariachi roots. Because El Mariachi, I was just shooting without even knowing you know, how the camera even worked. And then I did Desperado, which was more polished. That was about a $5 million movie. Um, and the studio wanted a sequel for a long time because Desperado did really well for them. And I was always busy with something else. But then there was an actor strike coming up and I couldn't go do Spy Kids 2 right away. And I had just seen digital cameras. George Lucas showed me a test of his first digital camera stuff when I was up mixing um, sound for Spy Kids up at Skywalker Ranch. I met George Lucas and he showed me some digital stuff. He said, what do you think of this digital stuff? I showed it to DPs and they all say it's shit. But what do you think? Because you, you're also a DP. And I looked, I said, that looks really cool. I, I would love to go shoot. I'm tired of working with film. It's so archaic and it's, I do a lot of special effects and we have to remove grain and do a composite, put grain back in. It's just really, it's, it's time has, has passed. We have to try to get into some new technology. And so I, I had a very short window to make a movie and it wasn't gonna be enough time to make Spike Kids too. So at the premiere of Spy Kids, which was March, the end of March of that year, 2001, I saw Antonio and I said, what movie are you doing pre-strike? Because when there's a, it was a writer's strike, when there's a writer's strike, no movie can go past that date, which was gonna be like in the beginning of June. And he said, oh, my movie felt to do. So you wanna do another Desperado? They're always begging for one, and I wanna test out these cameras. He goes, do you have a script? You'll have it next week. I started it at one point, I gotta go find it. And then I called, I was so excited to shoot with these cameras, I called Sony and said, I can do another Desperado, but we gotta do it right now, because as soon as the strike's over, I have to do Spike Kids too. And they said, do you have a script? You'll have it Wednesday. <laughs> and I went, I looked, and I looked at my computer, I thought I had written some of it, I couldn't find anything. So I had to start fade in, I had to start from scratch. This was March. In April, 
I turned the script in April 16th. Into March, I told him I was that script. April 16th, I stayed up all night, every night, writing. I remember when I was printing it out, I was crying. I was so tired, or I was so happy. I was like, I can't believe I wrote it. And then, uh, and then I couldn't get a crew because nobody wanted that job. No production designer wanted it, no DP wanted it. No DP wanted to shoot digital. And so we were in Mexico the next month in May. A week before shooting, we were literally opening the boxes, pulling out these Sony cameras, going, how do these even work? And we would turn on the monitor. It was just like the old days. It was like, well, I see an image, and it's recording. So I think it's working. <laughs> and I was the DP, so I had to DP it myself. And I told Sony, I thought they would just be like, what are you talking about? But they were really go, 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 go. I said, this is going to be just like Mariachi. I'm going to be the writer, the director, I'm the editor, I'm the production designer. I'm the composer, because this new digital cameras let you be your own crew again. And I was just telling them all kinds of shit, just to have them say, yeah. And they were really supportive. They were going, yeah, yeah, go, go, go. So I wrote the script. And there was whole sections missing, like the whole chase through the cactus town. That just said, mini road warrior sequence. Very cool. Details to follow. Because <laughs> I didn't know. I wouldn't know until I got down there and saw the locations. And I saw that cactus town. Went, oh, shit. Let's have them go through there. You know, just making it up. And it was really, really fun. And then I went and shot it. We had a week of prep. I carried a red blanket with me everywhere. Because Mexico's gorgeous. I mean, you saw that town where Johnny Depp is in. Anywhere you put the camera, it was so picturesque. It was like, OK, there. I mean, as a production designer, it was done for you already. I carried a red blanket around. They called me Rojo Rodriguez because I had a red blanket. If there was an eyesore somewhere, we would just throw the red blanket over it. <laughs> and it looked great in digital. We would just crank it up, crank up the saturation. And I came back after seven weeks, shot it in seven weeks. Any photo you see of me behind the scenes on, Mari on Once Upon a Time Mexico, I don't have sunglasses around my neck. I have a sleep mask because I just had no sleep. I would just put it on whenever I could catch an hour and then get back up and go. Because I was trying to get the movie done before strike. And I went back to the studio with it shot. We had Johnny Depp. We had a huge cast. I called Salma. I said, we're finally going to do the sequel to Desperado. Are you ready? And she said, oh, shit, I'm making Frida. Like before strike, I can't do it. I, I can't believe I've been waiting for this Prado. I can't be in it. I said, oh, fuck, I just wrote this whole script for nothing. Well, can you shoot any days at all? She goes, maybe at the very end, two days before the strike. OK, you're dead, and you'll be in the flashback. So I had to rewrite it for her. That's why she's dead in that movie. She was supposed to be on a whole other adventure with him. But that was the whole vibe of the picture. So I said, we're going to skip part three. And we're going to make part four, and I'll have flashbacks to three. How's that? <laughs> so that's just by necessity sometimes breeds the story. And it adds so much to the character, though, because he does have, in the first episode, he loses everything. And so he's always this tragic figure. Yeah, and tragic dark character. Figure. In and every movie, I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. Every movie's like another, ba another ballad that he adds to his collection of songs exactly. that he lives. As an artist, you live through your work. And when I went back to Sony and I showed them the movie, I, I, I finished shooting the movie, I was all sun drenched. And I saw the head of the studio. And she said, how did you make that crazy movie? And I said, what do you mean? And you knew I was going to shoot it in that amount of time. She goes, yeah, but we didn't believe you. We thought you were crazy. We thought you would shoot a quarter of it. And you'd be, Fincher's still shooting Panic Room. He's been shooting a year. <laughs> So they were all like, go, 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 believe. Whenever I would hand them some BS story of how I could shoot this in time, they were only being encouraging, because as soon as I left the room, they went, so what? We'll have him on the hook, and he can, he can finish a year from now. That's why that movie didn't come out to 2003. They didn't need it right away. So I went and actually shot Spy Kids 2, Spy Kids 3, <laughs> and then edited it. So I went to edit that movie. I didn't remember shooting it at all. It was like a fever dream. And I'm looking at the footage, and the studio was like, when are we going to see a cut of the movie? It's like, you'll have it next week. <laughs> so I started cutting it. I cut it in a blur. Like, in, like in, a, in, a, in about a week and a half, I cut the whole movie, except for a few sections that was just black. And it said, describe what the scene was, because I didn't have a chance to. Oh, man. Do you always do your best work just in those, bi those rushes? Or does yeah, that, I think yeah. the best work comes from that, for me, because it puts, you, uh, it puts you in a place where you're having to rely totally on instinct and creativity. Because when you let your intellectual side, um, um, you know, overanalyze it, you, you take forever and you'll never do it. And then it's not good enough. And when you are just have to go, you have to just rely completely on whatever just falls from the sky and you take it. 
And those are the gifts, you know, where the, inspir the stuff that you would like the most from the movie was all the fuck ups, that's all the accidents, all the stuff that didn't go right. Over all my movies, people come up always and say, oh, my favorite part is when this, this, this happened. I went, oh, well, that's because the sun dropped and we didn't have any light and we had to get the fish and put it over here. And they're like, that's my favorite part. So I thought, God, it's the mistakes and it's the accidents that kind of make it really human. You know, to try and seek perfection, we aren't perfect. So even if you could get perfect, which you can't, it's not possible. But even if you did, people aren't perfect. So they couldn't identify it. They identify with the, with the humanity of it and the mistakes. And so I, when I embraced that, I thought, I can make mistakes all day long. That's really easy. So I can just say, I keep giving myself less time less money, less crew, less resources to get back to that state. And it's so fun. Right now, it's the 25th anniversary, so I have a TV series for El Rey Network called Rebel Without a Crew based on my book. And I'm shooting my new $7,000 movie right now. We're documenting it so that people can see how you would do that today. And it's so much fun. It's just me and my, my son or my crew and any actor that's in it can come hold a light. Or one guy yesterday was blocking a light on somebody. I said, you're a human flag today. Can you do that? And they're documented so people can see how to do it. And it's, it's the most fun I've had since Mariachi because you're having to make stuff out of nothing and do a lot of camera tricks and in camera and move, move, move. You got to shoot it in 14 days. A whole feature in 14 days was $7,000. And when will the show come out? The documents uh, Next year sometime, yeah. Amazing. So I, I mentored five other filmmakers. They, made, they shot theirs already and they're editing, and um, theirs will premiere early next year. And then I'm shooting mine right now, so it's a blast. But it reminds you that when you are forced to just have a deadline and just make it happen, um, you can get it done because it just drops. It's no longer you doing it. You have to kind of get out of the way and let creativity take over. The creative spirit takes over because it just has to. Otherwise, you're there, hmm, it's not good enough. I don't know, maybe I need more crew. Maybe I need more money. Maybe I need a better camera. Maybe I need... And then you just never get anywhere. And then it's not good, it's overthought. And it, and it loses that, well for me anyway, you know, loses that, that thing that makes people wanna watch it over and over. It's that character, it's that homemade feeling to it that I think comes from just flying by the seat of your pants and relying totally on creativity. So what was it about um, the Mexico trilogy that wanted to make you to return to that place each time? Um, well, Mariachi first, I didn't want anyone to see it. So I thought, <laughs> I don't want people to think that's all I could do. If I just knew people were going to see it, I probably would have done things differently. So when I did Desperado, I made that more as a showcase of what you could do in 30 days in the same town. We actually went back to the same town and shot in the same locations. The bar that the first shootout happens in Mariachi is the same bar that Antonio goes in and shoots the whole place up. We used all the same locations and just to kind of show the difference. And then Quentin, when he was in that movie, he's the one that said, you're making your Dollars trilogy. This is your Sergio Leone, or Sergio Leone Dollars trilogy. You got to do the third one, but you got to call it Once Upon a Time Mexico. and You got to make it epic. So I said, <laughs> all right. And so then years and years later, that's what happened. When they said they wanted another Desperado, I said, I, you know, I can make another Desperado for you. It's called Once Upon a Time Mexico. Do you have it? Yeah, I'll give it to you. And so I thought, once upon a time, oh, what's, what's the good, the bad, and the ugly? If this is the good, the bad, and the ugly of the series, you gotta have three guys. So he's the man with no name, because he has no name, he's just named L. I need to have two, what's the other big concept? Man with no name, man with no eyes, man with no face. So that's how I, I started with that, and I came up with the guy who gets his face removed, because I'd heard about, you know, the El Chapo type guys who get their face reconstructed so that you can't find them. And then uh, I always wanted somebody to get, it was from another sci-fi script I had where a guy lost his eyes and his son, who had his memory wiped, didn't even know it was his father, was a C&I boy for the rest of it. And uh, I stole that from that script, stuck it in this one, and, and cranked out that script like in a you know, week and a half. Yeah. But um, again, you're just flying by the seat of your pants and it works so well, where that character works really well in this. And Johnny Depp playing it was just a, a blast. How did you go from Carlos Gallardo to Antonio Banderas? And was it difficult to imagine somebody else in that role, or how, how did that all happen? Um, no, Car well, Carlos was a dude that it was as a producer on the film as well, that to go get it remade, it, well, first we were gonna just remake it and remake it in English. And I had actually first discovered Antonio when I was um, writing El Mariachi, I was in that Pharmaco, you know, medical research lab, and we're watching movies all the time, and Tie Me Up, Tie Me Down came on. And I remember seeing him then and remembering him when, when Sony 
wanted to possibly remake Mariachi, I said, we could cast someone like, there was no Latin actors working in Hollywood at that time. We could find nobody. So I thought I was going to have to, I want this Latin to play this role. I'm going to have to just make him somehow, find him from another country and bring him someone that they recognize the name. And he'd been doing the Almodovar movies, which were more art films, but he hadn't really made it in the States yet. So I said, we can go get that guy who's really hot right now, Antonio Banderas. And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That gave us a chance to get it made at a bigger budget. And Carlos knew that as a, as a, as a filmmaker, too, that to see our baby go that far would be really cool and exciting. And the reason I even thought he could do action, Antonio had only done the art films. If you watch Time Me Up, Time Me Down, this is, remember when I was in the hospital very clearly watching this, this scene where Victoria Abril comes into the, to his apartment and he headbutts her, he tricks her and then he headbutts her. But he didn't headbutt her like that. He went <laughs> like that. I was like, whoa, what the fuck was that? <laughs> I said, this guy wants to, I, I bet, I called him up and said, you want to do an action film? He's like, I would love to do an action film, man. <laughs> I said, I thought so, because I saw the way you gave her the headbutt and it just <laughs> It came from inside and it scared the shit out of me. And, and that is all of Desperado. <laughs> He's just that intense. He's that intense the whole time. And he was so fun. And, and, I, and I had never really worked with real actors like that before. So I was totally spoiled when I was working with him. I thought they were all going to be like him. And there was nobody <laughs> like him since then. I mean, to work with him, he was outstanding. Collaborator, so creative, so willing to do anything coming up with a different kind of action hero, which was, I wanted to give it a Latin flavor. What does a Latin action hero look like? I loved seeing John Woo movies. This was a big problem back then. When I made Mariachi, it was in Spanish, and it just made me realize that there weren't a lot of Latin represented in film, much less filmmakers. And when I saw The Killer and Hard Boiled, which premiered at the same festival that Mariachi did in Toronto, I, I wanted to be Chinese. I thought, I want to be like Chow Yan Fat. I said, shit, it's the filmmaking and the way the hero is presented, that it crosses all you know, b lines. I want to do that for Mexicans. So then when people watch a movie, they look at it and go, I want to be the Mexican guy. Shit, did I just say that? Why is that? Because he's so fucking cool. And you never saw that back in then, especially. The representation in movies was horrendous. So I had to create my own star system. I found Cheech, pulled it, pulled Cheech out of retirement. Got Danny Trejo, cast him in every movie I had so he could finally star a machete. Sa Salma Hayek, I saw doing an interview on television, Spanish television, um, saying how she couldn't get work in the States because of her accent in English. Grabbed her, brought Antonio, and I decided I'm just going to put him in every movie I have until they're stars. So then I have a star suit. And it worked. <laughs> By the time we did Spy Kids, I could just, I could just like, Plug them right in like that. Well, the, also just the chemistry between Salma Hayek and Antonio Banderas. Is Studio is didn't think she was sexy. They were like, her? You want to cast her? And I was like, she's really good. I shot a whole other movie with her. She's going to be fantastic. It wasn't until they saw the first dailies. They were lucky. Oh, I cheated. I, I, I worked. They, we had an audition where we had different actors, actresses come in and play. And I... I um, took Salma aside the day before and I worked on her and her scene over and over till we got it just right. It was the scene where she's sewing him up, the best, her best scene in the movie. And she had it down pat. I didn't help anybody else. So when she did the audition, <laughs> it was clearly electricity between them. They're awesome. She's just on point. They saw it and were like, okay, you can hire her. And then <laughs> they saw the first dailies and, and that's, dailies means, you know, when you get the first film back and you're watching just the rushes, just the uh, uncut footage. And they're like, wow, they're so sexy together. Then it dawned on them. <laughs> Once they saw them in costume and then it was real, but before that, they just didn't have the vision. And I realized I just had to do that stuff on my own, covert, in order to, to break, because people just had made their own decision that it would not work. So you just had to constantly prove them wrong. And these movies were a great way to do that. Yeah. How do you play so many roles? on a single film. And when it gets bigger, like this, where it's a you know, multi-million dollar movie and you're, you're composing and editing and producing. Um, That's how just how I always started. I mean, it's, it's really funny. I mean, it's just kind of, if you look at any of my early, early movies, even this, it was so weird. I mean, even when I was 12, 13, 14, my fake movie company was called Columbio Pictures. <laughs> Columbio Pictures, the credits would come out. Then at the end, it would say, all the jobs, and it would just say my name like that. <laughs> 
because I just did everything. Because he shot on video, and so you didn't need a DP, you didn't need a, you know a sound guy. Everything was kind of built in. It was this transition was starting to happen to digital. This was way back in the '80s, and so you didn't need all those people. And you know, if you think back to the early, but I, even I thought you needed a lot of people. So when I made Mariachi, I, I thought. I don't want to bring all those people. I don't want people to see me fail. This camera might fall apart. I'll just go do it myself because it's just like shooting on video, except, okay, I'll have to do a manual iris and take a light reading, but that's just one extra step. Um, and manual focus, okay, I'll have to be more careful with the focus because it's not autofocus like on the video cameras. But I just used the method that I used with videos. And I loved that process so much that when I went to make the bigger films, I still held on to a lot of those jobs because the editing is so important. I mean, if you watch the editing in Desperado, if you handed that to a regular editor, in fact, the studio didn't want me to edit it. Originally, I asked, I needed to edit it because I made a cable movie that I had to take over the editing because the editor would just cut A, B, C, look at the script, and I, I shoot in a very particular way. And um, I just saw that I needed to edit, and the studio said, no, you can't edit. We've never had a director edit his own film. It would set a precedent. So, well, you bought Mariachi, and I edited that. Isn't that a precedent? They said, okay, but you gotta edit in LA because we have to watch you, because we don't think you know what you're doing, because we saw the dailies, <laughs> and your shots aren't long enough. You know, it would be a wide shot, Antonio walks in, and then you would cut. You didn't even cover the scene. I was thinking, oh, I guess that's usually how they do it. They just waste and just shoot the whole fucking thing from a wide. But I'd already cut it in my head, so I would just shoot the little pieces that I need. So it looked like it wasn't gonna work. And I cut the first scene of the movie, which is the best scene in the movie. You know, the, Bruce, the Buscemi scene with the like flashbacks and that whole majorly edited sequence. And I showed it to him, and they went, okay, you know what you're doing, and they left. <laughs> so that, for that point on, it set a precedent that I could edit all my own movies. Um, so it's all about precedent. So once I had done Mariachi and that got bought by Hollywood, it gave me the ability to do any job on any movie from then on. So that was a real blessing because as the movies got bigger, I found that it was gonna start losing that touch. So, I, and I liked those jobs. I really like composing. You know, sometimes I write the music before I even finish the script because you think, well, what does this character sound like musically? You know, the theme that Salma sings at the end of Once Upon a Time in Mexico? Da -na 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 -na. I, was I would be playing that on the set of Spy Kids 2 when someone came over and went, what's that song you keep playing? I go, I don't know, I just keep, I just keep playing it. And is it good? And they go, yeah, I like it. I go, maybe it's the theme from Spy Kids too, but no, I don't think so. Maybe it's the theme of Once Upon a Time in Mexico. And that's what it turned out to be. Turned into the theme, turned into a song, Salma sang it, it was really great. But sometimes things are, work non-linear like that. You know, the filmmaking business process is to have a lot of people and to work very linearly. You have to start with a script and then you go shoot it and then you get it, and then you hire a composer. Well, what if you did it all out of order? And that's what the freedom of just doing it my way does, because as an artist, you might want to start with the end. You might want to start with the middle, and it depends on each project, and that freedom allows you to make something really organically. And at the beginning of time, you know, filmmakers would be like, it would be like Charlie Chaplin in front of the camera, and one guy back there doing this. It wasn't a 500 people, and if you look up collaboration, collaboration is between one or more people. Doesn't say anything, I mean two or more people. Doesn't say anything about 500. Yeah. So people think that you need a lot of people to make a film and you don't. Which we'll prove again with the new movie Red Eleven. So my cast is here. I have to give a here shout out to my cast. awesome oh, local amazing. actors slash crew. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're learning from watching the young filmmakers with this, their seven thousand dollars on the show. What what did what did you learn by seeing by seeing kids today try to do what you did? I reminded me that I too felt that fear of being failing in front of anybody else and and thinking that I needed to like be more prepared first. And it's the best time. Uh, people sometimes ask me now, for years, how do you get so much done? I mean, how do you? It's like I, I set the bridge on fire and then I see how fast I can get across. You know, you gotta like say, I've got a script and you're gonna have it in your hand next Wednesday. Fade in. You have to do stuff like that or you'll never do it. And I would see that a lot of these filmmakers that I had found, they hadn't done a feature before. They'd made a lot of shorts but hadn't done them jump to feature. Why? Because they probably have a whole list, mental list of things that I need. I need a script for it's long enough, I need the right crew, I need this, I need that. The more things that are on your I need list, for whatever it is you want to accomplish, the further you are from that dream. 
And so I, I told him, but look, what's cool about this, and it happened to me on mariachi, and we're gonna recreate the same circumstances for you and myself, because I believe when you strip all that away and you take everything off the list and it's just you with a camera, you don't know how to operate, and you're gonna edit on a system you've never seen before in your life, that when you take away all the resources, you're forced to rely on creativity, and magic's gonna happen. I think, I don't know, we'll see. That's what I told him. <laughs> It's a petri dish, but it did. You would see them become different people just within four days. That they would become different people. What feeds you creative, creatively when you're trying to get there with a new project, or when you're sitting down? To I write tend that to do thing. many projects at once. You know, I like um, because if one thing isn't pushing forward, and you have something else, usually you'll find the answer. Oddly enough, to that one here. You know, so like I was filming Spy Kids 2 and the theme for Once Upon a Time in Mexico comes to me. You know, it's like that. It's it's because when you're in a create, when you're in this creative process, other ideas start firing and you need places to put them. If you're only working on one thing, um, then it's kind of like having all your eggs in one basket. You know, it's kind of like just keep going, just keep making stuff. People wait so long to move forward. You know, they'll, I'm going to write a novel. But they write the first page, it's not perfect, and they throw it away, and they never get anywhere. You just gotta charge through, and then toss it aside and go do another one. And then you'll end up with something really good if you don't judge it. So I, I tend to just be, um, embrace the process, which is, yeah, you're supposed to have fear going forward. You should fear forward. I mean, that's when you know, as an artist, you're on the right track. If you don't, if you're in a comfort, you feel comfortable, and you have no fear where you're going, that you're probably wasting your time. If you're the step you're gonna take is like, I don't know, I, said, I could really fuck up with this. This is like way over my head. That's the thing uh, I saw with the other filmmakers too. The, their, the belief of what impossible was, was here. And as soon as they got past it, it, it dropped to that. And they realized, oh, I thought that was impossible. Well, now it's there. And I found that from project to project that I would just keep raising the bar for what I thought was possible. Till it got crazy. I remember on Spy Kids 3, and I would have movies coming out. Spy Kids 3 and Once Upon a Time in Mexico came out within two months of each other. And they were both number one movies. Spy Kids 3, I had a Spy Kids movie in the theater every year with no pre-planning. Every year there was just another one. While I was doing other movies, and I remember Spy Kids 3 was the first digital 3D movie. So I was just figuring out 3D. Nobody had done it yet. That was the first one. There's only two digital screens in the whole country. We started shooting in January. It was another one of those, oh yeah, I have the script. Just hire the whole crew and have them waiting there. Fade in, you know. <laughs> um, it, I started shooting in January. It was in theaters, mostly on green screen, most of those visual effects in 3D, meaning you have to do all the visual effects twice by July. So in six months, I went from shooting to having that thing in the theater. That was the biggest one of the spike is, but it's because you just like, you set the bridge on fire and you go and you have nothing to do but rely on creative instincts. And then that's why, I don't know, kids like that one the most of all of them. It's, um, who, who doesn't love Spy Kids? It's a universal, <laughs> universally adored franchise. So the industry has changed so much since you did this. Where do you see yourself and the film industry today versus even, well, 25 years ago, but also just, you know, 15 years ago? With it's the been really movie. exciting recently because yeah. Um, there's just so many places now that want to buy exclusive content. For someone who's a content creator, if you have ideas, you can just be selling projects all day long. I mean, because now there's Hulu, there's you know, there's Netflix, there's YouTube Red, there's Verizon. Everybody wants exclusive content, so you can have a show and go. And several people, many people want to buy it. Or before, if you had a TV idea, you just went to the networks. Or if you had a movie idea, you just went to the studios. Now there's just so many people. And then brands too, they want exclusive content that doesn't even show the brand. They'll pay for everything and let you own it. I mean, it's like the Wild West again. I mean, it's really exciting. And if you were starting out right now, what would you do today versus back then? That's a good question. Sometimes I'm at a film festival, that's always the most uncomfortable because people say, what, what can I do to break out? It's like, well, should, you shouldn't be at a film festival because <laughs> everybody's trying to fit through that same door and you're competing with this many people and more. So you have to always think outside of that box. You always have to actually think bigger. Less people think bigger. There's less competition up there. Like if you wanted to go sell a TV show, it was like, well, we're all trying to fit on Friday night and 7 p.m. on ABC back in the day. 
How many other people are trying to compete with that? Own a network. You know how many people are actually trying to own a network? <laughs> Very few. The competition is hardly any. But you have to think, when you get up there, you realize the whole floor is empty. There's one guy over there thinking that big. It's the, it sounds really like just a toss-off idea, but it's actually much easier than trying to compete with everyone else going that If everyone's going that way, I've always gone that way. Because it's, it's, bump, it's a bumpier road, and it's, it's, very un, it's not very reassuring because there's no one else going that way, so you think, this must be the wrong way. They're all headed that way. And it's like, no, no, that's the whole paradox. That's the wrong way. Yeah. This is the right way. <laughs> and you're going to stumble, for sure. It's rough. It's rough. It's full of glass. But you're going to stumble, and you're also going to stumble upon. You're going to stumble upon an idea no one ever came up with because you went that way. So that's why I was like, everyone's shooting film still. I'm going to shoot digital. Everything's 2D. I'm going to shoot 3D. Everything's just normal photography. I'm going to shoot green screen. Always constantly just pushing, going that other way. And you always found success. Always found the promised land like within three or four steps. We are almost out of time. So anything else that you wanted to share about this trilogy that you remembered walking in here today? I remember when... Um, just before we started this $7,000 movie, I had my two sons here who were going to work on it, um, watch El Mariachi with me with a commentary, because I hadn't heard the commentary since I recorded it. And um, I knew I probably didn't remember all the stories. And we're watching it, and they're watching it. They'd seen the movie before, but they're watching them because it's cool. The commentary plays while the movie's playing, so you're getting sucked into the movie. But you're hearing the stories, and they just kept turning around going, this movie's impossible. How did this thing even come together? It should not have even happened. All the things, like the actors didn't know. Those weren't actors. They were just people we found. I would find the person. Carlos would say, how about this guy for the bad guy? Yeah, he's, he'll work. <laughs> Is that your, what's that shirt? That, that checkered shirt you're wearing? OK, that's your costume. Bring that every day whenever we call you in. Just wear that. That way I don't have to think about the costume. The girl had three costume changes I picked out of her closet. Just keeping that straight because we shot so out of sequence. I didn't show anyone the script because I was afraid that if they saw how much work they had, they wouldn't show up again. <laughs> so she actually shot her scene first where she died because um, the, the guy who, who was holding the gun to her had to go off and become a doctor. So we shot him in a few days all out of sequence, and that's why they just brought the same outfit. He didn't have a black T-shirt. He was supposed to be the man in black. He said, I don't have a black shirt. Not one? What's the closest thing? The blue one. Okay, your name will be Azul, and you'll have a black vest. <laughs> so when they say the man in black, the two guys dressed in black, the guy's not even dressed in black. He's dressed in blue. But that's just how it was. And uh, it was just so fun. It was just so fun to just crank it out. And, and um, I only fed them a few lines at a time. I didn't show them the scene. They didn't know what they were saying. I would say, okay, here's your first two lines. Go shoot it. Okay, forget those two. Here's the next two. And so when we called her back the, uh, later that week to come back and film, she said, but I thought I was dead already. So, oh, no, that was the end. We still got a few more scenes. <laughs> <laughs> she had no clue she was in the whole thing. And I was like, I forgot all that. And then, like, that prison we found at the beginning, that's we went in there. Carlos told me about it. I said, hey, my ranch hand got picked up for drunk being drunk, and they took him to this. It was a cool little, cool little jail out there, blue jail. Let's go film there. They don't have anybody. Only a few prisoners. So we went in there. We asked the cops, "Hey, can we borrow your guns? Do you have any guns?" And they opened the drawers of Uzi. <laughs> yeah, you can borrow this one. Put blanks in it. They knew Carlos because he grew up in that town. Eh, Carlitos is making his movies again. <laughs> hey, we'll move some. We'll move the prisoners into this other cell so you can have that cell. And one of them was being unruly. I forgot all this. This was in the commentary. One of them was being unruly, and, and they said, hey, he's being unruly. Is he ruining your sound? No, nah, we're not recording sound. I record that separate. It's okay. No, nah, we'll take him outside anyway. He escaped. He escaped, and they had to go chase him. <laughs> they went, they had to go find him. They brought him back an hour. I totally forgot all this. My boys kept looking like, what the fuck? How did this movie even come together? The whole thing's held together with scotch tape and popsicle sticks. I'm going to do a show... Uh, right now where we're going to play music from the movies and and this, there's a screen there's a screen behind me that plays footage from the movies and then we do it in sync to the picture it's really cool but the first song i'm going to play is the theme from El mariachi and if you watch the screen um it's kind of like film school in a song so as we're playing this song it's going to show raw footage of the bus sequence like the actual raw footage and you'll see that there, and then it'll show it edited. So you can see how I did the movie. Um, there's no slates. You'll see the, the actors holding up their hands at the head of the roll, like roll 15. And then you'll see a flash frame. That's when you start filming on film. And 
him starting to run up the stairs, and then another flash frame, because the camera was so loud. It would go like this. <laughs> it just sounded like all your money was running away. So I'd go, <laughs> run faster. <laughs> Cut. So I would say, I would, I would say action, and as they start running, <laughs> cut. Then I would call cut because I had to preserve as much film as possible. So you'll see just flash frames, him running up, him missing the guitar. Then I get a tighter shot. Then I get a wide shot and a tight shot, and just very sequentially. And then you'll see it cut together, and you'll see that there's no fo no footage. It's practically a one to one, and uh, and it shows that's just how I made the whole movie. It's just one take, and the magic happens. Why? Because Creativity blesses those who trust it. Big round of applause for Robert Rodriguez on the Mexico Trilogy. Congratulations on the 25th anniversary. <laughs>